Welcome to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Podcast. Each week, we interview the best and brightest in physical therapy, wellness, and entrepreneurship. We give you cutting-edge information you need to live your best life, healthy, wealthy, and smart. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Karen Litzy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. And today's episode is another episode recorded live at CSM. And this was the CSM After Dark presentation, mastermind put together by Sean Hagee. And it was a really emotional and enlightening discussion about diversity within the physical therapy profession. So I'm actually not part of this at all. I was just there to record. Uh, The members of the panel are Dr. Rupal Patel, Dr. Monique Carruth, Dr. Uchenna Osai, Sherry Teague, and Dr. Lisa Van Hoos. So there's probably going to be about two or three parts to this CSM After Dark because It was such a robust discussion that we can't have a two-hour podcast, so this one's about an hour. And in this podcast, you're going to hear all five of these women tell their stories, tell their experience being in the minority in the physical therapy world. So I hope you all take a lot from this. I know I did, and enjoy today's podcast. All right. Good evening, everyone. How's everyone? Woo-hoo. Awesome. All right, so Sean asked me on Twitter, hey, will you be part of this panel? I'm like, sure. And then he tells me who the other panelists are. And I'm like, okay, I will need this to get through this, but I'm I'm good. So my name is Rupal Patel. I'm a physical therapist. I teach at Texas Women's University. Um, And I'm going to just start by kind of telling you my story, my, you know, what, what, what I'm about. So I came to the United States at the age of... 10 and a half or so, and my grandfather's whole purpose of sending us uh, to America from India was a better education. And my uncles came to the U.S. in the 60s on student visas as engineers. My dad didn't want to come to America because he had a really good job as a social worker working in the prison system. He loved that and had a cush job, and he didn't want to go. But his father said, no, you have to go for your kids. And so he did. And when he came here, he um, could not find a job as a social worker. He would have had to go back to school. So he decided not to do that. Um, And so he decided to basically just work to make ends meet. And so, you know, one of the sometimes uh, myths about Asian Indians is that, yes, we're a minority, but we're a model minority. And that most of us are well-to-do, and that's how we grew up. And so I come from a blue-collar family because my father worked in factories and McDonald's and all that stuff um, two years before he actually was able to bring us to America, my mom and my brother and I. And then he moved us to Texas in 1980s when the oil was booming and he was able to find a factory job there as was my mother. And so that's where we were. And we bought our first house, American Dream, as an immigrant family. And just the year that I was graduating high school, we had the oil (laughs) bust in Texas, 1986. And so we had to foreclose on our house so that I could go to college because that was the goal of coming to America, was go to college. And my dad's dream of having a home, having his own home, was gone. And he, he didn't think twice about it because it was like, Well, you have to go to college, and then your brother after you, and so we'll live in our apartment. And so I remember when I started, I I, I went to university at Texas Women's University in Denton, and I remember going there, and after they dropped me off, and they said goodbye, and, you know, tears and all that stuff. And I said to myself, when I get this education, when I get this degree, I'm going to pay it back, you know, in terms of I'm going to get my parents that house because... That's what they deserve. That's what they came to America for. And so, you know, but the interesting thing was when I wanted to become a physical therapist, um, well, first, as every Indian kid, you become either a doctor, nurse, or an engineer. It's not only Indian. Yeah, well, that's all, that's all the only professions that were allowed. And so I thought I wanted to be a cardiac surgeon. 
And so when I was in health occupation education in high school and we did preceptorships in the hospital and I went to the cardiac cath lab and I sat there for an hour with the surgeon and I was bored out of my mind because all he did was like a little pipe cleaner and just like the patient was asleep and it was very cold in the room and I'm like, I can't do this. This is not my personality. Like I, can't, I don't even talk to the person, nothing. And, and I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to do this. Like I don't want to do this as a profession. And then we did other preceptorships, walked into the PT department at Memorial Southwest Hospital and people are talking to each other and they're engaged and they're touching and doing this. And I'm like, what is this? I've never seen this. I've never heard of this. Like I like this and uh, found out about it and uh, talked to the director there, asked her what it was all about. She allowed me to be a, a candy striper there that summer. But I knew it was going to be a hard sell with dad because, you know, when you're an immigrant kid, it's about not just the education, but what is the value of that education in terms of jobs and economy, you know. And so, you know, I had to, like, look up Bureau of Labor Statistics as a 17, 16-year-old because I knew my dad's going to want statistics. Like, in 30 years, are you going to have a job? Because if you're not, you're, there's no way you're going to college for this, you know. And so I did that and presented my case, so to speak, you know, and reluctantly he agreed. And of course, being a woman and a minority and Asian Indian and a conservative family, he did not want me to go away. But Texas Women's University is the best public school out there, and especially in Texas. And so I wanted to go to the best school. And so being a woman's university, I think, saved me because dad was okay me going five hours away from home to that. And, um, and, and you know, and, but the biggest thing was like, I don't know, he told me, I don't know any physical therapists that are Indian <laughs> that are not of his generation of kids. Most of the Indian therapists, and there's probably some in this room, were immigrants that came here as adults that were recruited to come here home health companies, skilled nursing facilities, lots of shortages. And so there was nobody in his friend circle and even some people older than him that had kids in college who he looked up to as an immigrant. Like, <coughs> these are the kids I want you to model. And they're engineers, doctors, and nurses. And you want to be a PT, you know? And so he, he had a really hard time with that because he did not know anyone <coughs> that looked like him and me that was a PT that had been raised here and so that was a big issue. And I think when we talk about diversity, that's a huge issue, is that our students, our you know, employees, our mm -hmm. colleagues, you know, they have, you know, and yes, people like, it's not just about face diversity, but let me tell you, when I look around, I see black, I see white. I mean, you see what you see. I'm brown, okay? You see what you see. So that, you have to own face diversity. You just do, okay? And that was a big issue with dad, you know? And so, you know, it took a while for him to kind of, you know, say, okay, I'll let you do this. And then, yes, the job possibilities are there. And, you know, what's been cool is, of course, he's a proud father. And uh, now he talks about physical therapy all the time. And he's been, you know, he's never had PT, but mom has, you know? But, and mom's going to pelvic PT now. Oh my God. You know, 75 year old Indian woman going to pelvic PT. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, you know, but the thing is, what's been cool is, you know, I've had to find my own role models, and they have not always been Indian, um, but I have sought out role models of all, you know, all, all types of people, and I've been guided in my career, and that's been very helpful. And I think probably the biggest guidance, which is very silent, is my parents, you know, because it's their unconditional love and support that has been kind of my beacon, you know? And, and really it's, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, I guess I'm a daughter of India and a daughter of Gandhi. And so Gandhi always, Mahatma Gandhi always says, you have to be the change you wanna see in the world. And that's always something that my parents have raised me to be. And so that's kind of my mantra. And it's like, you know, if I, if I wanna see something change, then I have to take up action to do it. I wanna be a physical therapist. I wanna be a role model. So the coolest thing was when, um, one of his friends that was younger than him, his daughter wanted to be a PT. And I knew this girl since she was little and teenager. And, and she, you know, a teenager came to me and then she actually got admitted to our Dallas program when I, our Houston program when I taught in Dallas. And so she's a physical therapist now and there's others. And you know, they, her parents still come to me every time I go to the Mandir, uh, our Hindu temple, you know, like, oh my God, it's Angel, talk so much. Yeah. So it's cool to pay it forward and to be that role model, you know, of someone. So. That's my story, my diversity story of being an immigrant, blue collar woman, Indian, PT. I mean, I don't know how many hyphens I can put on there, but you know. <laughs>
That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, she's next. Now we're going this way. You're number two. Okay, I guess I'm number two. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Monique, and I am also an immigrant. My story is very similar to Ms. Patel's. Um, well, my sister is right across there, and <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, she's just two years younger than I am. I'm the oldest, uh, but they boss me around. Um, <laughs> I remember we were watching a cricket uh, game. I don't know how many of you know about the sport of cricket. What the hell is cricket? <laughs> it's better than baseball. It's much better than baseball. <laughs> you got that right. The bat is flat. You can actually hit. Um, so we were watching, um, we were watching the uh, game. Uh, it was West Indies versus India, actually. And um, one of the players uh, got injured. And I saw this guy running out onto the field with a huge bag and something just said, I think that's what I wanted to be. And my dad looked at me like I was crazy, like, what the hell? <laughs> okay, like she said, Caribbean parents want their kids to become doctors, lawyers, or engineers. That's it. So nobody knew about physiotherapy. Um, it was a struggle for me to find a place to try to go to study. So my options were Canada, the U.S., and England. So I settled for the U.S. Um, so I came here. <laughs> okay, wrong choice of words. <laughs> the best option was the U.S. Uh, <laughs> so um, I was fortunate to um, get a soccer scholarship to um, attend college because my parents honestly could not afford to send me here to go to school. Um, so I came, and I was greeted by a sign that says, all aliens follow this line, all residents follow that line. And I was like, alien? <laughs> Am I an alien? So that was my first encounter with being different or being labeled as something different. Then they wanted to take my fingerprints and scan my eye and everything like that. And there were so many restrictions being on a student visa. So I actually got homesick. She can attest to it because she joked about it on our drive down here. That I called home almost every day telling my parents that I wanted to come back. And they were like, no, you left here to go there to fulfill something. So I'm glad I didn't return. So almost 19 years later, I am a physical therapist, um, a successful one at it. I'm thankful. Um, a lot of people ask, how was my experience um, being an African-American woman? Well, first of all, I tr tend not to identify as African-American because I'm not African, neither am I American. <laughs> so I'm black. <laughs> or I ch if there's no black, I check other and I put Caribbean or West Indian. People are like, what the hell is the West Indies? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we are in the Caribbean, and we're just above South America. Um, so I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. We're just above Venezuela. And yes, we speak English. I get asked all the time by my patients, wow, you speak English so well. What's your first language? And I'm like, English. English. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it has not always been easy. Um, I had to learn to modify my accent. I still have one, but it's not as pronounced. Um, because in school, a lot of people couldn't understand when I spoke, so I had to repeat myself a lot. Um, I was asked to talk slower and to enunciate my words. And um, on one of my final clinical rotations, I was selected to go to a very prestigious hospital in Maryland. and. Um, Bear in mind, I've already completed almost two and a half years of graduate school. I've completed bachelor's degree. And the first time I met with the director of rehab at that program, she stopped while we were talking and said, wow, you're more articulate than I expected. And I didn't know what to... Everyone tells me that I wear my emotions on my sleeve or my face. Thanks. And I tried very hard to not make her seem like, 
<laughs> wow, that was pretty um, insultive. So I smiled and I said, oh, thank you. But it was not to, um, it was not a pleasant thing to say to someone. Well, I took offense to it because I'm a graduate student. Um, I'm educated. I do not know how he expected me to sound. Um, and again, I speak English well. Um, during that clinical rotation as well, the staff was, they were all white. However, the help or the aides were all black. So I battled with who to sit and eat lunch with every lunchtime <laughs> because <laughs> I sat with the aides one lunchtime and they said, oh, we don't eat with the, the aides, come eat with the PTs. And when I left them the following day and went to eat with the PTs, the aides were like, oh, you feel like you're better than us. So I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna take my lunch. <laughs> 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 And it's so no one could ever say that, hey, I'm, I'm picking or choosing. But the experience taught me a lot um, to be culturally sensitive, to make sure I watch the words that I say to people. And uh, Todd posted something recently on Twitter. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Todd. Todd, right there. Uh, the white guy. Yeah, he's the, most, he's the most woke white guy I've ever met in my life. <laughs> Again. He's the most woke. Woke. Hashtag woke. Ooh. Jerry takes offense. <laughs> Jerry takes offense. No, no, no. But Jerry is too. Jerry is too. Um, you're quite welcome. But he said it. What does woke mean? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I like I need an introduction. Oh man. I expected that from a Patriots fan. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Oh. We're we're good. We're good. We're good. Um but basically being woke is um being in tune with um diversity, um social issues, um things that uh different like in your belief system and acknowledging that we are not all on an equal playing field. Um, a lot of people tend to feel uncomfortable when we talk about issues like this. I myself feel uncomfortable bringing it up because a lot of people say, oh, you're playing the race card, it's not like that. Or it's a joke, it wasn't meant to be offensive, um, but it is to some people. Um, but we don't want to appear angry. We don't want to fit the stereotype of an angry black woman. A lot of us get fit into that stereotype. If we, <laughs> if we try to point out the things that are incorrect, um, we get labeled that way. So we try to be as passive aggressive as possible. My mom always... <laughs> She will attest to it. My mom is very quiet, but she's a very quiet leader. And things would happen, and I would call and I would complain, and she's like, you know what? When in Rome, do as the Romans do, so just stick your tail between your legs and keep your mouth shut. That's what she would usually say. Um, my dad, on the other hand, would be like, tell them. Okay, so it's usually like the good person, the bad person, so... Um, but I have to speak up because in order for a profession to grow, people have to be aware that they're not dealing with colleagues who are like them, who believe the same things that they believe. They're also not gonna be treating patients who believe the same things that they believe or live the same life that they live, okay? I don't care if you live in Wyoming, North Dakota, like Maine, uh, <laughs> Alaska, <laughs> maybe. You're gonna meet an immigrant somewhere, okay? And yes, I'm one of those from a shithole country, and I'm proud to be from a shithole country. <laughs> um, so when you make statements like that, and there are people who believe the same system as you do, and I go and I knock on their door and say, hi, I'm your physical therapist, and they look like, oh my God. They sent a black person to treat me? Oh, no. 
Yes, I'm doing home health. Yes. So you're um, on people's doors. Yes. So I'm going and they're opening and they encountered with someone who's different. And to a lot of them, especially if they live in a rural area, it's a huge shock to see someone who is completely different. And geez, I have an accent. So they're like, oh, my God. You know, should I let this person in my house? How comfortable am I going to feel? So I have to be really aware of the environment that I'm in so I can make sure that the patient gets comfortable being treated by me. Um, as a profession, we don't um, do any justice in supporting people who are not like us because I see a lot of arguments that um, happen on Twitter especially someone disagrees with disagrees with you, it gets into like a, a pissing contest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm better, my view is better, and they start insulting one another. And if we can do that to ourselves, um, what are we, what sort of image are we actually giving to consumers who are actually looking at us on social media? And trust me, they see stuff. Because they're like, oh, man, you PTs fight against one another. Um, if you have certain stereotypes, you're already going to predetermine how you're going to treat a patient. Um, there was one time I had a colleague say, oh, my black patients are always late. And I'm like, yeah. Because you know, I remember the first time I met Jerry, I told him, hey, don't expect me to be there at 4. I operate on CPT time. Um, <laughs> Caribbean Pacific Standard Time. <laughs> In case you didn't know. And there's IST, Indian Standard Time. <laughs> so I made him aware that I was probably going to be a few minutes late. Um, <laughs> but I was going to be there. Um, so if you ever meet a Caribbean person, or, yeah, Indian too, because we have a lot of Indians in Trinidad, and they said they're going to be there five minutes, Give them half an hour, okay? I'm just telling you guys the truth. But um, people make comments like, yeah, the black patients are always late or they never show and stuff like that. Um, but they don't take into consideration that a lot of these are single mothers with multiple jobs. They have to go to pick their kids up. They don't have any transportation, so they have to rely on public transportation. A bus might be running late, that sort of stuff like that. And I know everybody's crunched for time, but take these things into consideration as well, too. Um, another thing that we push is for people to eat healthy. And I don't have kids. I live by myself, well, for now. Um, but if I go to the grocery <laughs> store and I try to buy healthy food, and I look at the bill after it's done, I'm like, how the heck is, are we expecting a family of six to survive on a healthy meal every single day it's not really realistic. So we have to try to teach them other ways and to be healthy. I like the push that you're doing, uh, encouraging people to move. Um, however, city planning, if you live in a high crime area, an area that doesn't have any sidewalks, um, and it's not really safe, how can you be going outside to walk? Um, or play or have your kids play because they're on the risk of getting robbed or getting shot by a drive-by. So a lot of things do not apply to African-American patients that we try to um, encourage people to do. So we have to think of ways to consider uh, socioeconomic factors in order in the way we treat as well. Other things too, like um, recently, um, I usually have a student with me um, every summer Two summers ago, I had a Caucasian student with me, and we went to a home. The person opened the door, and they greeted the student as a therapist, and then said, oh, this must be your, your tech or your aid. So I smiled, and I said, of course I am. <laughs> so we went into the house, and the student was playing along for a little bit, but when the questions got a little bit tough, she finally admitted that, look, I'm just a student, she's a therapist, and the patient turned completely red, and she didn't know if to apologize or things. So I said, oh, no, let's let it go. Another incident is um, we went to a rural area in Maryland. Uh, the patient just had cardiac surgery. She would not look at me. 
it was very uncomfortable for her to interact with a black clinician. So she would talk to the student. The student had to relay the information to me. And then whatever I would say, she would look at the student, but she would hear what I had to respond to. <laughs> and the student was like, wow, I would have never thought that a black therapist would have to go through this. So I said, okay. So purposefully, I took her to one of the most... Um, urban areas that I could find um, to see what her reaction would be being in a situation like that. So we were driving up there and I could see that she felt like really uncomfortable. So I smiled and I said, we're going to be okay. <laughs> so we were walking into the house and we were, well, some guys were out on the block, you know, and they said, how are you ladies? And we're like, we're fine. We're here to see Mrs. So-and-so. And they were like, Okay, we'll keep an eye on the car and stuff like that. But she was still uneasy. She was, like, clutching everything and, like, walking uh, very daintily. We got into the house, and the patient had two of her younger sons sitting there, and they were smoking, um, stuff that you could get a contact high off of. And I could tell she was very uncomfortable. So I said, relax. We'll see what happened. Um, but the patient was so nice to her because she could sense that she was uncomfortable, so she told the boys to clear the, clear the area, have her sit, and go to the basement or whatever. She offered us something to drink. Of course, we said no. But um, at the end of the session, uh, the patient apologized at first for having her son smoking. Uh, but the student felt so comfortable that she realized that sometimes you can't judge a book by its cover because... A lot of these people do need help, but because of the zip code some people live in, um, and it's a known urban area, a lot of therapists will refuse to even approach those ho um, homes to offer care when they're the ones that need it the most. And we have to do better as a profession. So um, I'm just going to round it up. Hi everyone, my name is Uchenna Cynthia Awele Osai, but everyone calls me Yusi. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a pelvic health physical therapist, uh, assistant professor at the University, University of Texas Dell Medical School, um, and founder of UC Logic, which is a sexual health platform for adults. And I was very surprised to be asked here to speak about um, diversity. And I wasn't sure what to talk to you all about. And so I decided to talk to you about my experience in PT school. Mm. It sucked. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I, I went into physical therapy to become a pelvic health physical therapist. That's all I wanted to do. That was the only reason I joined the profession. And when I entered, um, I saw, I was in a sea of white faces, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, my whole life I have Nigerian parents. You know, excellence is everything, Uchenna. You know, they, Uchenna, A, where's the A, you know? Um, they, put, they put my sister, and, my sister and I were in private school from age five through 18, right, with nuns on campus. <laughs> like really you know and we were like I in my graduating class of 200 I was the only I was one of three black students and so I'm used to being in white spaces I'm used to accommodating I'm used to making everyone comfortable to be around me and when you talk about and I'm gonna get to health but when you talk about the health of minority populations it's that accommodating that people don't realize that we have to do all the time. We have to, we have to elevate ourselves mm -hmm. to be in spaces that, you know, don't have to accommodate. That in and of itself is stressful. Very stressful to the body. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. And when I finally entered PT school, I thought, okay, you know, higher learning, the holy grail, <laughs> right? Like, yes, Jesus. <laughs> and it was shocking. Like, people, they dig their heels in. Wait, what? 
<laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and I will never forget this. I called my mom crying the first day. I said, you know, mom, I, I, all this money, all this sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And she said, what did I tell you? Oh, let me do the accent. Uchenna. <laughs> <laughs> what did I tell you? <laughs> eh? Having a degree does nothing. You're still a fool, <laughs> right? You can have all the degrees in the world and you can still be a fool. I just need you to have the tools to take care of yourself so that they can't look down on you. And that, that was my mother's framework. My framework, I just wanted to treat people. I wanted to minimize suffering. That was my goal. And I'm not going to get into the details of what happened to me in PT school out of respect for the institution, but I will say this. Um, The process of going through PT school where you're the only one and then you have professors who do the denial through op oppression through denial, mm -hmm. right? Where it's like, oh, you know, I treat everyone the same. Mm -hmm. I don't see color, <laughs> you know? Lies. The China penis, Lies. no different. <laughs> like, well, what's the difference, you know? Trust me. <laughs> like, it's not the same. <laughs> you know, it's not the same. And what, what protected me, what um, saved me in PT school, I was about to leave. And my professor, Demetra John, Dr. Demetra John, was the wokest white lady I have literally ever met. And she, she said, you see, we need to, you have something that we need to develop. And the PT program is not enough for you. So she made me do this Albert Schweitzer Fellowship. And I was around all of these students of different professions. And it was outside of PT school. I had to do this in addition to PT school. But that's where I thrived. That's where I learned the most, sadly, where I got the most support. And that's where I started my work with the LGBTQ plus population, because I had to learn how to do community health assessments, how to design sustainable community health interventions. And I worked with LGBTQ homeless youth because Chicago had the largest population in the country. I think it still does. And that's where I saw the intersectionality, what the foster system does, right? What gender and sexual orientation, all of that compounded. And then if, on top of that, if you're Asian, if you're Native American, if you're black, it's even worse. And we're not teaching that in our schools. Nope. We're not teaching, we're not looking at this from a social determinants of health. We look at it as individual motivation. Oh, this person is not eating right. They're not exercising enough. You know, it's, look, I can do a joint manip to the cows come home. But if someone just got kicked out of their house because they're transgender and they live in a state that won't protect them, that pain isn't going to go away. Right? Evidence-based medicine isn't going to help that. But if you have a healthcare provider who is tuned into that, who's tuned into the differences, that, that is important. But then when you're looking at the students who are growing, who are trying to learn, and you deny <clears throat> their experience, deny, I mean, God, it was so stressful. It was so hard to, to finish that process when I felt like I had no one. I had no one. I had my crazy Nigerian mother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I had Demetra and, you know, my sister who was in law school, who was dealing with her own, like, she called her law school the plantation. <laughs> She's like, I'm going to the plantation <laughs> library so I can get away from these dudes. And that's, we joke to this day, but that's kind of how it feels sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, <laughs> I, I can't, I, it, it doesn't, every time I walk in the halls of CSM and I see black people, I want to be like, hey, you I give see them the you. Yep. What's Anytime up? I see an Asian person, I'm like, hey, I see you. you know, I see you. I want to be there for you. But there, there, is a, there is a disease that we have called complicit 
complicitness. We just sit and watch. You know, my classmates saw me struggling and they couldn't get behind it because fundamentally they were like, well, I'm not racist. I mean, I'm friends with you. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I struggled teaching them because I'm like, you know what, I'm just trying to survive this oppressive environment. I don't have time to train you. And they would say, well, you see, why are you so mad? And it wasn't until recently that I, as a black woman, was like, I'm allowed to be mad. Mm -hmm. And I'm good with that. I'm not an angry person, but I can be mad about things. I can express my anger, and me disagreeing with you is not anger. Just because my opinion is not in congruence with yours does not make me angry. It mm. makes me have better sense than you. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't like it. So then you're going to call me angry <laughs> to try and oppress me, but then I'm just going to keep telling you the truth. But we're not, we're not teaching that model in PT school. We're not teaching that model in our continuing education courses. We're not, we're not promoting those environments. Because, you know, I had to tell my boss very recently about the whole angry, angry discussion. And she said to me, well, I was in Peace Corps for two years. <laughs> okay, like I, you know, it, does, it doesn't protect you from having bias and it doesn't protect you from automatically assuming that I'm about to jump out and choke you when I'm just saying, no, I, d I disagree. <laughs> But that's, but the, I mean, am I right? No, I know, I trust me. Y'all feel me? Right. Get these hate. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but I think, I think that what, what we need to start doing is having these discussions like this, mm -hmm. is having people at the table, is having like our white men here, is having all people of all colors, all experiences engaging and talking because I don't want this experience to continue. Right? Like, I have little cousins. I have my Nigerian cousins who are in PT <clears throat> schools. I'm like, hey, hey, hey. But I'm like, call me. Call me. As soon as they start to act crazy. You know, it's not like I'm going to do anything, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be supportive to them. I'm going to say, hey, let, let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do to get you through this. I think the med schools do such a better job at this, too. Right? You know, like, even at my med school, we have minority students where if they're struggling, they have like, there's seven or eight faculty members of color or of the same gender or of the same experience who are assigned to them. And then they are, they have a buffer and that is not in place in our programs. So I'm going to conclude with that and thank you all for listening. <laughs> and, and we honestly don't need anything to drink to talk about this and I have to tell you I am in awe of these women and I feel a little bit less being up here no, and I say no, that no, no hang on I say that I say that because I'm ashamed of my race and how long we've let this perpetuate I'm ashamed and I've been ashamed for a really long time but to hear you guys speak so eloquently and so proudly and as you should because you're awesome I think about all the things that we could do as Caucasians, as people born with privilege, um, and that we should be doing. And I appreciate you guys sharing those stories. And I have to tell you, um, Lisa and I were going to arm wrestle over who was going to go last. And, and <laughs> honestly, I was just like, I want to just sneak away. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and for those that know me, know that I really don't lack for things to say <laughs> ever. Um, but I, I just wanted to say how much... I appreciate you guys sharing your stories and, and I learned things today and I will take action because I'm an angry white woman. <laughs> okay? Pound it out. <laughs> I, just did, I just did 23 of me, so that's up for debate too. Okay? Because my family was you know, from Sumter, South Carolina, so you know, oh. you never you know. You got one drop rule. I got the one drop. One that's drop. right. <laughs> okay. My that's right. Oh, I knew that the first time I met you, honey. Okay. Um, I, I am, my name is Sherry. And I'm a PTA. There I go. <laughs> but even worse than that, <laughs> I have a master's degree in athletic training. So I'm an a certified athletic trainer. You're out. Okay. 
<laughs> but so just be prepared. I'm only going to give you 85% of my story tonight. Y'all going to have to guess the rest. Okay. Um, I'm also out loud and proud as a lesbian. And as someone who often gets confused as being the other gender. Okay. So what I wanted to talk about tonight and what's on my heart is that situation. And I wasn't real sure up until probably about a day ago what I was going to talk about. And then something happened to me on the trip here. <laughs> My wife and I, and those of you that don't know that lovely purple-haired lady, and I have been running these streets together for 25 years yeah. this month. And my parents were upset when she got me when I was four. I'm just saying. <laughs> so that lady's taking you out of the house at the age of four. Because <laughs> y'all know I'm 29. <laughs> okay. So we're in Mississippi. Oh, my. Woo. M I, crooked letter, crooked letter, I, crooked letter, crooked letter, I, humpback, humpback, I. And if you don't know what that is, then you're from the north of the Mason Dixon line. <laughs> Because us Southern girls, we had to learn how to spell. Right. That's right. That's how we learned how to spell Mississippi. Yes. It's about 8.30 at night and it's dark. <laughs> but I had to pee. <laughs> and people in my situation who are five foot nine, north of, <clears throat> and I don't have bodacious tatas, <laughs> I often get confused for the wrong gender. And so going to the restroom can be quite the special treat. And so we pull into the rest area, it's dark, and we go up to the restroom door and, and there's a, a, a guard, a security guard at the door. And if I tell you that it was Barney Fife at the age of 902, <laughs> that's about right. He had his hearing aid, things hanging out of his head, and he's stopping people. Stop. He came up to about my chest. And he says, stop, there's some men in the restroom. And I said, okay, so we're standing there. And the, they, the custodian was cleaning the men's restroom, so they, they let some men go into the, You just wait here till the men get out. And so Dee's standing in front of me, and as the men were coming out, he, he looks at me and he says, you got to wait until she comes out. And I said, excuse me? you got to wait until she comes out. And he's insistent. He's putting his hand on me. you got to wait until she comes out. <laughs> and I said, why is that? Do you think I'm a man? And he just looks at me like, yeah, duh. <laughs> And so then I proceed to grab my breasticles and ask him if he needs to see them. Because, you know, it's not enough that he doesn't know that I can't, that he thinks I can't read. That's Dee's line. It, it's then that I'm going to go in and molest her. Okay? So finally I call out to the custodian lady who's standing, you know, a good 30 feet away from me in a, in a darkly lit space and say, Ma'am, excuse me, can you please tell him I'm a girl? <laughs> Pop! She screams, Pop! It's a girl! <laughs> and so I laugh, ha ha ha, and walk into the restroom. When I come out, that poor man was almost crying. He was so upset that he had mistook me for who I was and all that stuff. And I felt kind of bad for him for a minute, but that happens to me quite frequently. And it usually happens by somebody who's older than me, smaller than me, and it's more this. They look at me, they look at the door, they look at me, they look at the door, and they go, ps, 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 ps. are you supposed to be in here? So that was an experience. That kind of solidified what I was going to talk about today. I've been fired for who I am. Days after being a finalist in a company of 3,000 for the employee of the year. Didn't get an explanation. But based on what happened, I knew what I was fired for. That was back in 1993. At that point in time, I decided I'm not ever working for anybody again because, you know, if I work for somebody, apparently I get fired, so I might as well just work for myself. But in those situations back in the 90s, those of the, in the room that had been through this, and I'm seeing some faces, and it wasn't ever talked about what happened or what they thought. There were no words put to it. There was no, it was whispered about. It was, it was, it was you know, the old boys club would talk about you and they'd say, well, you know, we don't want to invite her because we don't want to do this. And you knew you were getting looked over because you were different. Okay? Ended up getting that job back for the record for the same pay for less work. 
because I don't shut up. That's what I said, the angry white woman. So my experience is not any different than what these ladies have gone through, but for a very different reason. But the same types of things have happened over the years. And one of the things that I know that I'm so happy, or it's Bree, right? I want to make sure I remember your name. Bree has a thing coming up on Saturday from 12 to 1 in the Royal Room over here. And it's about a special interest group for LGBTQ folks and physical therapy. There's more of us than you know. Uh, we always used to joke that if everybody turned purple on the same day, it'd be an interesting day, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, the patients that you meet that are LGBTQ, they're at risk by simply being who they are. Um, some are at more risk than others. The younger ones are more at risk than others. Um, but never assume, you know, those of you that are straight, I call them breeders. Does that mean? <laughs> Those of you that are straight, just always assume, assume that you don't know. Ask the questions in a very non-binary way. Ask, who is your partner? Not who is your husband? Who is your wife? Ask this simple question, which pronoun do you prefer? Really simple. Don't assume that someone who looks very feminine and acts very feminine and is beautiful is not going to surprise you with a penis. <laughs> okay? So that is so important when you're dealing with health issues that you, that you take the time to be, I like it, hashtag woke. <laughs> you take a moment. <laughs> a simple suggestion for those of you that have clinics or maybe you have people that have clinics or you work in a hospital-based system or you go into skilled nursing, how about non-binary restrooms? How about every single restroom having that little skirt figure who never was me for the record and the pants figure on the same placard for every single one? Why? Because it makes a big difference to be able to go to the restroom comfortably. It makes a big difference not having to hold your urine for fear of being approached by somebody who has no clue what they're talking about, who thinks you really can't read when it comes down to it. So, so just take that moment to do that. Um, take a moment to understand that the climate that we're in right now, politically, and I'm probably going to upset some people, I don't care. But when it comes out that certain rules and regulations that have been passed to protect folks that have been put on the margins are no longer going to be in effect to protect those people, i.e. you can refuse to treat someone, could mean the difference in their quality of life of being able to live how they want to live for whatever is the remaining years of their life, and that that judgment is harmful, okay? Understand that really clearly. And, and so when you take the moment, look at your forms when you get back to your office. Does it say Ms., Mr., Miss? What does it say? How about just patient? Patient name. Here's a thought. Simple little changes like that can make a huge difference in someone's life and the way that they're going to approach you and how they're going to respect you as a clinician. And if you ever want to have some time, and, and I, you see the, the, the working with the at-risk youth, God bless you. God bless you. Take the time to go down to these shelters and talk to these kids that have been completely ostracized from their family, and their health is the last thing on their mind. Survival is. And take a moment to spend a minute, and, and you know, you don't know who's there. It could be the next Mahatma Gandhi. You know, it could be the next... Mother Teresa, it could be the next greatest person in the world. And all they need is a mentor or somebody to look for them. But, you know, that's, that's kind of my story, and I hope that it, it resonated a little bit. I saw some nodding and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, listen to these women. I have to tell you, y'all are awesome. And, and take a nugget from here and understand that you could make a difference as a health care provider. You can make that difference in somebody's life. And, um, and if you have... Get in your heart 
to come here, whether you're straight by, whatever, come and visit tomorrow, okay, or Saturday, excuse me, and and let's start something big in this in this profession that we've all chosen to make things better. You know, let's let's be a, a kind of a beacon for that. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We just gonna let that soak in yeah. for a minute. You gotta let that soak in. Oh, thank you. you gotta let that soak in. I am Lisa Van Hoos. Yes. So I am going to ask you for some help in this last five, seven minutes, right? I'll try to follow. I'll try. It's not my nature to follow the rules, right? And I, I'll explain how I have evolved into this person. Um, so when you think of slavery, right, what adjectives would you use? Hmm. Brutal. Brutal. Oppression. Oppression. Pain. 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 Inhumane. Inhumane. Shameful. Shameful. Accepted. Ex- Accept it, yeah. right? What else? Painful. Painful. Come on, white guys. <laughs> white guys Sean. 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 Look at it, you, Sean. Wealth. 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 We got wealth. 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 Right? Any other plantations? Misunderstood. Mm-hmm. Plantations. Plantation. Honestly, biblical. Biblical. Supportive. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And so. I will be the first to admit when Sean asked me to do this, I did not want to do this. And Sean also asked me if I would write a blog. And y'all, I told that man some lies across Twitter. (laughs) Right? Because he he was like, Lisa, I'm waiting on your blog. People say you say awesome things. And I was like, but I ain't putting it in writing. (laughs) Right? Amen. And then, like, he was like, I'm really excited about your blog because, like, he's very woke and forward thinking. And I was like, mm, but you got the complexion that allows that. <laughs> so, true. so I was just like, and I even talked to my husband, and my husband was like, just put it out there. He was like, you know what? You're going to die. You might as well do it. <laughs> he's, like, none of, he's like, none of the people are coming to your funeral, so just say what you want. <laughs> to a wonderful man, a wonderful man, who's just, I think his mantra in life is just ethic, um, which is great for me. So then I actually met with my chair. Sean, you don't know this story. I met with my chair, and I said, I wrote this blog. I'm really concerned about the blog. I said, because, you know, I'm, I'm debating what my career in the APTA is going to be and in the profession. And if I put this blog out here, there going to be some white people that's going to pick up some pitchforks <laughs> and we're going to have some problems. And I was like, and I just want you to know, because I work for you, right? <laughs> and when they come, they're going to be like, why you ain't got your little black girl under control? So I'm like, they going to come for you. Should I put this blog out here? And Nancy Reese, who is a force to be raking with, was like, well, then they'll just effing deal with it. (laughs) That's my chair, right? So I was like, thank you, universe. Thank you, God, for putting me with the right person. And so then I I sent the blog to Sean. And I still was not fully committed, and I sent it to you. And then I sent it to Mike Eisenhart. And I was like, look, people, just read this. Read this and be... you sent it to me? I sent it to you. You ain't check your Twitter (laughs) yet. And you hurt my feelings because I was Don't like, I'm trying to reach out to a sister and be like, I'm like, I was like, just let me know if it's gonna be in a landmine. Is it going Am I putting my foot in a landmine? Right? Girl, you gotta text me that stuff. What's the only girl? I'm like, you a rehab professional? Prevention. So I I'll read it, it later. I know you will. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> no. And I truthfully, y'all, it was, I have to admit, I did not commit to sending this out for other eyes to see until this morning. Because that's how nervous I was about being out front. 
And when I even when I sent it to Sean, I was like, look, number one, check it for grammatical errors. Um, and we're going to talk about why in just a minute. And then number two, I was like, let me know if it's going to take people too much into an uncomfortable place, right? Because people can only tolerate so much loading, right? We know that from cognitive research. And, and as a minority, sometimes you got to massage your message a little bit because people can be sensitive, right? That's why I was sensitive. <laughs> and so I was like, I just need to know, okay, how this is going to be perceived. And I was talking to my husband about it again, and he's like, I just don't understand. Because um, if you know me, every morning I start my morning with meditation and prayer and that. And I ask for wisdom from God and the universe on what to do. But inside, I will be the first to admit, I probably lived out the movie 12 Years a Slave. Anybody know 12 Years yeah, a Slave, I mean. right? Where I'm free, but I'm trying to run from people that's trying to enslave me. Yeah. That is kind of how I feel like my life runs. Yes. And like those words that you, those adjectives that you just gave me about slavery, that is how I'm going to be real honest with y'all. That's how I feel about PT at times. Mm -hmm. Those same words. Mm -hmm. Where the group that I feel like is supposed to be my pack, a lot of times goes, we don't want you. Mm -hmm. And that hurts, right? It's, it, it hurts. And I think women can understand that hurt because we do that to each other really good, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm supposed, you're supposed to be my safe place. And then I'm like, get out of here, girl. We don't want you. But PT feels like that a lot when you're, you know, not the certain color, maybe not the certain sex, not the certain size, right? And, and I had to kind of process why I have these issues with PT, and I'm not going to cry. I had to process why. I'm just going to keep looking at you, see, right? Because the hair is fierce. I, I got and it cut says, today. I got cut today. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> So the hair is fierce. So I, I just look at the fierceness. But I had to realize that some of this is not about Caucasian people and what people are doing to me. and Because it's real easy to kind of fall into that victim space. Yep. Right? A lot of it is just baggage. And where I would love for the profession to go is I think holistic admission is going to be our saving grace. I really, really do. And I think programs just need to embrace it and commit, right? My favorite quote is from Yoda, right? So do not try. Mm. Just do mm. or not do. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? Because we've been having this conversation for 30 years. I, st I began PT school in 1994. I don't know. Whoa. I don't know. You're a baby. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Baby. And I feel like, oh my God, we having another diversity conversation. <laughs> I'm like, is this sound for real? And the blog, when you read it, kind of talks about that. That I hope that it is for real. Um, because every diversity co conversation causes me to cycle, right? It's kind of like a dysfunctional relationship. So sometimes when I talk about PT, I talk about it from a slavery standpoint that I feel like I'm a free slave and y'all trying to enslave me again and I'm running for my life and y'all kind of running behind me with shackles. And then other times I feel like it's like a dysfunctional relationship, like you act tainer, you're right, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm done being beat, right? I'm done. And so I truly have to reflect on it in kind of my lived experiences. But I think that holistic admission is going to allow us to really address the diversity and inclusion things if we do it from a pure place. Because what I feel like the profession is doing is we are using the term inclusion as a way to put a Band-Aid on it, mm -mm. right? Because what we are saying, because I'm going to be honest, we are using inclusion to make the majority feel really good. Because we're going to talk about your characteristics, your attributes. We're going to try to make you feel like you're diverse also. And I'm like, they were already diverse, right? <laughs> when you walk into a room, everybody's diverse. But we're using inclusion as a way to make, and I'm just going to say it, make white people kind of feel good. 
and not really diving into the issues. And so part of my baggage sometimes, I'm not calling it baggage, it's my identity, right? It's mm-hmm. who I am. It's, it's in my DNA. It's not your baggage. Yeah, it's, it's not negative. I am from Arkansas. Born and raised. Yeah, right. The Uh, only thing that saves Arkansas is Mississippi. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. It's true. That's the truth. (laughs) Any metric, if you ask any public health person, any you know health disparities person, we like where Mississippi at. Are we okay? (laughs) (laughs) And so I grew up in Arkansas. In Arkansas is an interesting place because the racism is so obvious, right? You know where you can live. You know where you can't live, right? Mm -hmm. In Harrison, Arkansas, we used to have the national headquarters of the KKK, right? So Harrison, Arkansas is 45 minutes from my house. And we knew. So like Arkansas is beautiful. There are gorgeous parks, right? And as PTs, we tell people to get out and about and exercise. In Arkansas, there are certain places you don't go, even right now. I love camping, but I'm not going up past, <laughs> girl, past Russellville. I'm not going. <laughs> not by myself. And I have a girlfriend who's a PT, and she's like, Lisa, you need to get a pop-up camper. And I was like, why? So I can die in it? And you're like, What's wrong with you? Right? Because she was like, you don't have to stay in the cabins up there. You can get a pop-up camper. Yeah, that's a great idea, right? So when the clans set it on fire and push it into the lake. It's a great idea. It burns quick. Right. So this is kind of the environment that I grew up in. And so it tells you to stay hiding. Hidden, right? Yeah. Hiding. Hidden. So that's why I asked you for grammatical checks. But anyway... So when you grow up in an environment that is so blatantly racist, you learn that safety is to shrink back. And as a PT, as a black PT, African-American PT, which basically means you was a descendant of a slave, PT kind of reinforces that. So like everything that I'm trying to tell myself that I need to grow out of and evolve and become this new person and metamorphosis, right? I come into PT and it reminds me that I'm not worthy. And so the baggage that I have from where I grew up at, I was a teenage mom. I had my first kid in the 10th grade. I had my second kid in the 12th grade. I was sexually abused from the age of 2 to 16. So I've got all this dust that's telling me that I need to kind of remain unseen, right? And I will be real honest with you. I have cousins that were not assault that were assaulted more than I was because the men in my family realized I was smart. And they said, you know what? We're gonna let you be a little, we're gonna kind of keep you safe and coddle you because you're gonna make money for the family. And so I think sometimes we forget the stories. And when I hear Faculty members talking, you know, through admissions, and they're like, well, this student is a minority, and they're going to come in here with all these issues, and they don't have resilience and grit. I'm like, dude, I got grit, (laughs) right? I'm two years old with grown men coming at me. I got grit. I'm like, let's have an honest conversation, you know, or the fact that I'm a teenage mom who my mother was like, I'm not watching your kids. I didn't have sex. I didn't enjoy it. So you taking them with you, right? So I took two kids to school with me, one-year-old and a two-year-old. So it, it bothers me when I hear these conversations about students of color and how they're not prepared and they're not going to be able to deal. Yes, and that we're lazy. And I'm just like, you don't know my story, Right? You don't know the fact that I am one of 200 first and second cousins that has a PhD. You don't know that I'm the only health professional in my extended family. So if anybody gets sick, I'm going with them, right? If anybody gets a prescription, somebody's calling me, saying, what is this? The doctor didn't explain it to me. Or if somebody needs surgery, they're calling me, asking me. So then when you come to my office and you're like, well, I didn't see you this week. 
I'm like, you don't know that I've traveled across the country to go help a family member. I'm just like, just stop and talk to us because you just don't know. Don't make the assumption. And I'm sure everybody has attributes and characteristics and things in their lives, but there are just these biases and stereotypes that we have about our minority students and our faculty that I'm just like, girl, I'm up by four and I'm down by two. Mm -hmm. So when you tell me that I'm lazy or that I'm not engaged, I'm like, I'm just trying to stay in this chair and not fall over because I'm exhausted, yep. right? And then you got me sitting on every freaking diversity panel known to me, <laughs> right? I'm just like, 12 years a slave, I'm running. <laughs> I'm running. <laughs> but, and it's just, it's like, and because there are so few of us, and because we're passionate about Ooh. helping others and telling our stories, right? that then we say yes. And then you tell us, well, but you're fat and you're overweight and you're a little angry. And I'm just like, have you read the research? <laughs> if I'm sleeping two hours and my circadian rhythm's off, hell yeah, I'ma be fat. Evidence-based, right? So if you don't want me to be fat, help a sister out. Sit on the diversity council, mentor some minority students, mentor some black, faculty members. I'm like, help me out. I just would like some help. The other thing is, is from a research standpoint, mm. <laughs> there is nothing that bothers me more than students telling me, clinicians telling me, oh, you're Lisa Van Hoos, mm -hmm. right? Because they look at my CV and they automatically assume that it's going to be somebody else, yep. right? Or they'll say, oh, oh, you you did that by yourself? I'm like, who, who else going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. Who, who else? Who, who, who doing it? Because if I got a helper, I need to know. Because I got some extra work for that person, right? And, and I love me some PTAs. Love me some PTA, yeah. right? <laughs> but here's my thing. If I walk into the room, your first assumption should not be that I'm a PTA. I cannot tell you how many times at conferences people say, oh, you're in the profession. What PTA school did you graduate from? What made you think that? Hmm? What made you think I was a PTA? Because you were awesome. That, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I have... I Tatas too. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So ultimately, I think if I had something to say, I would say, find out what people's stories are before you make assumptions. When you're sitting in your admissions committees, really kind of dive in and do a holistic admissions approach. When you're talking about your minority students that are in your program, before you make that assumption that, that student is underachieving, ask them why. Like, I have a student right now, a Hispanic male, who was homeless for four, the last four weeks of our semester. He was homeless and did not want to tell anybody because he is one of maybe four minorities in his cohort. And he was like, you know, minority males, and he was just like, I did not want that stigma. So then we're like, well, why is he not performing on his anatomy exam? Because he's living at the shelter. He is eating meals at the shelter. And we got two, almost 250 people in this department, and we had no clue. But we would, if you gave us the option without asking him, we would have dismissed him. And he is the primary caregiver for his entire family. Like, they are all like, okay, when he makes it, we make it. And we were going to ruin his dream because we don't want to ask questions. So I guess if I had to have a take home message, ask questions, mm -hmm. ask questions, ask questions. Yeah. yeah. I'm winning. <laughs> Thank you for listening and please subscribe to the podcast at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media.